Hello there, cartoonists and cartoon lovers, and welcome to another episode of The Cartoon Pad. I'm Bob Eckstein with my host, Michael Shaw, and my producer, Marty. Thank you to 11 Acorn Lane, our house band. Gentlemen, how are you doing? Hi, Bob. Hi, Hi Marty. Bob. Hi, Michael. Hi, Bob. So we've been getting a lot of feedback for the show, but... Um, we have decided to continue the show anyway, right, <laughs> right, Michael? Yes, I just got this uh, two telegrams. One says, don't. The other one says, stop. So it says, don't stop. So we won't. No, no, keep those coming. Uh, we want more letters, but as grandma used to say, if you don't have something nice to say, uh, not that grandma was a cartoonist, but she was a piece of work. Uh, we want the letters and... Uh, we are going to continue. When you said we had some feedback, I thought maybe uh, the note was you were putting your microphone too close to your speakers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's mute uh, Marty. Um, <laughs> well, I do have some ideas for publicity that I think we could help with the show. We would, we're going to let the audience hear some of these ideas, a little spitballing here. But I was thinking of some ideas that we can go to MoMA with to try to do an installation. Like cartoonists never really explore that avenue of art. And we could do our own type of like installation. I was thinking of like, if we were to sit in an exhibit for like three months, just sit in a chair still, and people could come sit down and then they leave. Another person comes and you just sit there for three months straight. So but Bob, are you familiar with the work of Joseph Boys? No. He was a conceptual artist, I want to say, in the... Okay, someone will know this better than I am, than I do. But he was a conceptual artist, and he was famous for sitting in a museum with a dead rabbit. And people would walk by, and the installation was called Artist Explaining a Painting to a Dead Hare. Oh, God. so it's already been done. I'm sorry. Well, all right. All right. I have another idea. I have a better all right. idea. There are no bad ideas in no. spitballing. Yeah. yeah. Except for no, that here's one. A, here's another one. A Volkswagen, right? I drive a Volkswagen. And I try to run you over. Well, <laughs> uh, okay. Next one. It's now, got potential. Let's go back to the sitting idea. Uh, who's okay. up for it? I mean, I'm, I'm in Pennsylvania right now. And, and Michael, you're in Green Bay. I'm thinking Marty's perfect for this. Yeah, I could just sit. I, you know what? There was a guy, and maybe this was an art installation, but it, it was definitely a video of some sort where someone lived in an Ikea store for like 30 days. They like lived in Ikea. Oh, I and, love those um, Swiss meatballs. Yeah, they're good. They're made from Swedish. Horse. Swedish oh, meatballs. Swiss, right. Thank you. <laughs> I like the and, uh they could, uh, you know, there, maybe it could be like Life of the Cartoonist and it would be a person sitting on a stool just sobbing. <laughs> or it could be a cartoonist that just kind of hides until after closing and lives there because their career is such a miserable failure. All this, good ideas. All these, good ideas. These are solid. Let me write these down. We're going to go to <laughs> MoMA. Um, today's guest is very important and we don't want to take up too much of our time. So, Michael, I know that this time around you did most of the questions and I was going to ask you to practice on me, maybe like I'll play it like Jessica. And you could run like the first question or two by me and we could just do a little test run here. Sure, she's Bob. Coming on I, soon. Uh, can I ask a question first? I'm ready. Okay. What's the first question? Oh, your question you were going to ask her was when did she first realize her dad's job was a little different from others? Bob, when did you first realize, I mean, Jessica, when did you first realize that your dad's job was different from others? Oh, I, I would say grade school. Oh, actually, my dad was a bus driver. Yes. Right. And we used to get phone calls from people complaining that he had taken a busload of people and got them lost. He was really bad at remembering the directions. At one time, he one time was like up in the Bronx and he was supposed to be down in Queens. Ooh, yeah. what Is year? Good? What year of a bus was this? This was in the 1970s. 
I grew up in the Bronx. Ooh, nineteen seventies uh, New York bus driver. That oh, paints yeah, a yeah. picture. Yeah. Remember, Kurt, was it Kurt Russell played Snake? Escape and it was like from the, New York. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, a little bit of trivia. Escape from New York was filmed in East St. Louis because being a fine St. Louis boy, I I would know that. Now, were you an extra? Is that true? Uh, no, I was not needed. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> and where was where was Car Fifty Four? Where that are was you? The 50s, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's a little before my time. And your dad's first name was Ralph. Uh, yeah, he had a, his best friend um, Ed Norton. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hey Ralphie boy that that show was my dad's favorite but it was very depressing and your and your mom you know your dad kept threatening to punch your mom's lights out and send her to the moon it was you know it didn't sound like the happiest childhood this is just sad yeah mr, mr. producer nice callback our first <laughs> guest of the podcast his famous cartoon was astronauts land, landing on the moon and finding alice crandom you remember that ah, wow yeah, yeah, it's that's full circle. That would be edgy today. That yeah. was out of this world. <laughs> so um, let's see, uh, Michael, are you working on anything interesting? Any cartoons? Well, what's interesting is we're going to have a secret word today on the podcast, and ah, secret... you have been working. You've been yes, working. yes. I'm 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 no slacker, sir. So the secret word is thankful. Spell. Now, can, can you tell us and we won't tell her yet but can you tell us what that means uh no but it's spelled t-h-p-r-i-n-k-t-h and it's a gag line there's your hint you're saying this as if you expect our listeners to have a pen and paper ready that they take notes i'll repeat that T H P R I N K T H. No one's going to so understand. Stay tuned for this. this. Yeah, we've lost half the audience. Just can now. you can you tell people what it is that you're talking about? Just that, that uh, understand. Okay, it? there's a cartoon where a man is licking an ice cream cone that's covered with. I think, well, in Boston, they call them jimmies, but uh, in other places, they're called sprinkles. But when you say sprinkles, when you have sprinkles on your tongue, it comes out. So, How long did you practice this in the mirror? I really wasn't getting it until Marty did it once, and it was, I, it was instant. Marty's asking I, me right now in a text, and he please drive that Volkswagen. Yes, please. Okay. I need to look at that. Oh, there's no text. You kidder. No, listen, listen. I have to be more supportive of your ideas. And I think that this was a great <laughs> idea. This is something we're going to do at least once a year. Word of the show. It's very good. And I'm taking over your bus. Oh, please. And your do. father's bus. Let's leave my mom out of it. She took over the bus uh, okay. route because he was bad with directions. How do you, okay, this is way off. How, how do you, can you be a, you know your route. How can you be bad with directions? I'm he terrible had with a directions. He actually had a passenger help him. Bring him back to the depot. Oh, Lord. Yeah. Bob, I, I have a newfound empathy for you. <laughs> or sadness. You were joking about Thurber, but... I mean, Thurber has always been your guy. Yes, yes. In fact, uh, I've always channeled Thurber just for lack of anyone else to channel. No, because he's Midwestern. He's recalcitrant. He's a little cranky. He's like, you know, kind of lost in the world. He's, he's my hero. I was just listening to Bob Mankoff on NPR on an old interview. This was like from two, three years ago. And they were trying to explain why New Yorker cartoons are different from all other cartoons. And at what point did the, the style change? And Bob was, was stating that it was Thurber who ushered in the style to be silly. And you can have just a juxtaposition of, of odd elements. And that can be good enough to be a cartoon. A cartoon didn't have to be logical anymore, but it could have a seal in a bedroom 
And it could be, yeah, a mix. Yes. Of also, Thurber ushered in the, he was the champion of the caption. Up to then, uh, ideas were submitted and to cartoonists and cartoonists just kind of drew them. But he was really the first cartoonist that combined his own captions with his drawings. And also he was, he, since he couldn't draw and he couldn't see, he, he often stated the caption was the most important part of a cartoon, not the drawing. Now our guest is associated with a person who ushered in the third era of New Yorker cartoons. Correct. I agree. Through a device which we all use. Called the eraser. Call, <laughs> yes, call, call the eraser. No, it's, it had a, been, it's a banner. You, were you going to say the banner? Like the sort yes, of like, and yeah. you know, the banner had existed before, as we discussed with John Held Jr. I mean, there had been banners before, but I think what our, the subject of our podcast tonight, what that cartoonist ushered in was a comic comic strip sensibility to the gag cartoon no i think that you put it the right way he has said that himself in his own words that he always came from that background and he was a huge fan of strip cartoons we're not saying the name we're being a little coy here but we are we are but that's that's our nature i I am excited about tonight's guest i actually showered and um that brings me to a segue that we have a new product to um, advertise. Ooh, yeah. We have a new shower curtain. Oh, I, yes. I really appreciate now how important the shower curtain could be. This shower was a lot less work with a shower curtain. And the, the Weekly Humorist is selling a special custom shower curtain with uh, an illustration I did recently called The New Normal. And it's an homage to the New Yorker cover of Ninth Avenue. Uh, 10th Saul, Avenue for those. Saul who, Steinberg. That's right. Thank you. Who's a huge influence on me. I mean, when I was in college, that was my guy in the same way Thurber was your guy. Yes. I, I was trying to um, learn and imitate Steinberg. So this was just an homage to it. And it's um, sort of eccentric to the pandemic. The so Steinberg you, Institute will be in contact with you soon. For. Oh yeah, but um, if you. Marty, Marty, if you could give us like no, it reminds me of. Re- re- I'm sorry. Go ahead. What am I doing? If people want to buy, if people want to buy uh, Bob's beautiful uh, cover illustration, the new normal, it is available at the Weekly Humorist shop. You can go to humorist.shop. That's the domain, isn't that cool? Last the, the domain is dot shop, humorist.shop, and look for the new normal. We have posters. Uh, roll up uh, 16 by 24 glossy posters and we also have a shower curtain and we also have um, 11 by 17 glossy glossy posters so and we'll also throw in for how much bob uh the elements of stress book the elements of stress and you could take a shower with me if you buy a copy that and would the, be the stressful yeah el- the, the elements of stress is a new book that uh, you and i wrote last year and um it's really helping people across the whole country i mean the numbers have gone down. The numbers have gone down with the virus and everything. And I think a lot of it is a tribute to the book. Yes. And also we are seeking out new and improved stress. Because <laughs> the numbers, stress numbers have gone down, but the reviews of that book have gone up. If you've, uh, yeah, if you've looked, it's been very it's good. It's true. Yeah. I get a lot of feedback. Humorous. Dot shop. Is dot shop a thing now? Apparently I bought it and it's a wow. thing. Wow. Humorous dot shop. I'm going there and I'm going to shop. Well, we got to promote it. We got to do our job. I go around, I I, I rate the podcast and I notice that other people have been rating the podcast. And I am actually sincerely surprised that people are listening and telling me, when do you think the next episode is coming up? This morning, I got two emails, one from even Michael Madlin that said, do you think it's possible to put up the next episode earlier? People really like it. We don't want people binging, though. It's not healthy. No, that's not healthy for anyone. Our next guest was an artist, writer, web designer, illustrator, internet consultant, 
publisher and now is at the chief marketing and communication director desk at the cartoon stock. She also curates cartoonist Jack Ziegler's estate, who happens to be her dad. Jack was arguably the greatest modern gag cartoonist and published over 1,400 New Yorker cartoons. Let's welcome to the show, Jessica Ziegler. Hi, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. We're all so excited to have you. This is great. <laughs> Thanks. Um, let's first start off with your job you're doing now. Um, Michael, did you want to ask Jessica first? Oh, about yes. I, I, I know most people call her Jessica, but I call her beloved client <laughs> because I'm doing a bit of copywriting for her. So how does the blog, how did the blog post go? I haven't heard anything. I'm a little. Oh, I know. I know. It's been so crazy over there. Yeah, it's, it's good. It's good. We're kind of batting it back and forth and ah, you know, like, a, like some... a kitten with a mouse. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So I took a, I took a stab at, you know, running through some of it and now I've sent it off to the, the powers that be to see, you know, what their thoughts are, but then the well, weekend powers happened. Be. It... Yeah, that's right. The weekend happened and everybody wandered off. So yes, I call that running copy through the gauntlet of love. Mm, that's Otherwise right. known that's right. as your work is a fire hydrant. And now everyone pees on it. <laughs> Sometimes it really does feel that way, doesn't it? But uh, I, I'm used to that. that. The day job of copywriting, you just let it go and see if it comes back. Right, right. Yeah, that's a good approach to have. And Jessica, what is an average day for you over at the cartoon stock? Oh, boy. Well, um, you know, I do. A, I, I run the blog, which encompasses like the cartoon caption contest. So that's a thing every week. I do all of the emails that go out to all of the um, the clients and the customers. So there's always stuff going on with that. You know, having the cartoon stock, the new site, the relaunched site up, you know, that has the full store on it with all of the different, you know, being able to get mugs and prints and t-shirts for all the cartoons that exist on, on cartoon stock now. And it's all in one place, whereas before we had the two separate locations. Now it's all melded into a perfect little cartoon nugget. Oh, excellent. I call it the giggle of Googles. Oh, by the <laughs> way, Bob promised not to turn the podcast into one long information, inform, infomercial about the cartoon stock. So I will. <laughs> so how did you become involved in the Internet's greatest resource, resource for cartoons? <laughs> well, I just I kept uh, banging on Bob's door. You know, and just said, that would, how about that would now? be Mankoff, how about not Eckstein. No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bob, Bob, uh, Bob does dream of you banging on his door, but you know, <laughs> we're, we're not going there. No, no. Best not to. Best not to. Okay. Yeah, but he had, um, we had talked about it about a year before he had um, gotten involved with Cartoon Stock. And, you know, it was kind of like in progress, in progress, in progress for a while. And then I put together a show in Vermont um, several summers ago. Uh, with about 20 different cartoonists. And he was part of that. So I was able to pin him down to a location and really say like, okay, are we are we doing this? Is this going to happen? And yeah, so once, uh, once, once we got the go ahead. It's interesting because I was actually, I talked to Bob once and he was in Cincinnati for a showing of Saul Steinberg, this massive mural he had created. Mm. And they also, it was at the Cincinnati Art Museum. And this had to be, uh, I'm going to guess, 2008, something like that. <laughs> he, he wanted me to drive him to the airport. And Bob, I have to say, my sense of direction was about as bad as your, your dad, who was a bus driver, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, he was talking then about this, about cartoon stock, because he mm. wanted to create the world's most are the internet's most extensive collection of cartoons where cartoonists could put the cartoons they wanted to put on the web and offer mm -hmm. to wh whomever. Yeah. So right. this has been percolating for a long time. Right. Right. Well, you know, I mean, he started the original cartoon bank back in, you know, the nineties, whenever that was. And, you know, the whole, the whole, the original goal of that was to, give cartoons that were not published a place to live because, you know, as you guys well know, 
the amount of cartoons that you sell is far smaller than the amount of cartoons that you cre- that you create. And there's there's a, there's a lot of tankage, as I would say. <laughs> but it's not that they're all bad. It's just that you know no. you can't always you know you can't sell every one because there just aren't that many locations for them. So you know originally that was the goal to find homes for you know ways to use cartoons that hadn't sold. And then, you know, he was able to bring in all the New Yorker stuff to kind of, you know, reinvigorate those cartoons and give them more life, you know, additional sources of income for the cartoonists. You know, there's no reason a cartoon should sell once and then just be gone forever. It's tough making a living as a cartoonist. It certainly is. It's harder now than it was, you know, when my dad was doing it. That's for sure. Yeah. I mean, as a marketer, have you thought of any new ideas to maybe do down the road for cartoon stock as a promotion because i have an idea oh okay well let's hear it you know that contest when everyone holds their hand on a car the yeah. last person to pull away wins the car uh-huh you know most of those contests are cartoonists but those are all <laughs> struggling cartoonists and i think now <laughs> if you could brand it to be you know pivot it to a cartoon stock and make mm-hmm. it bob's tesla now oh. bob's got a tesla car <laughs> And I know that he really is behind this, you know, relaunch and stuff. And, you know, I, I just suggest maybe he wants to put his Tesla up there and we'll find, a, you know, 25 cartoonists who are struggling. Just an idea. Uh, so you're asking him to give away the Tesla just in the name of the cause. That's the next meeting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll see how that goes over. I'll float that. We'll see, or how, you could, we'll see if that gets any traction. You could put up a cartoon and the last person to laugh <laughs> wins the cartoon. <laughs> The last person to laugh. Hmm. Uh, we're 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 working on it. Yeah, got a lot of bugs in this idea. <laughs> Jessica, you also manage your dad's website, which yeah, I right. do a lot because I'm a huge fan of your dad. And just for the listeners who don't know, uh, Jack Ziegler was one of the groundbreaking cartoonists at the New Yorker in the golden age of gag cartooning, and. You've been working on the website. The website's complete. It's a really great website. So if people want to enjoy your dad's work, it's a great place to learn about him. And I have read everything there and listened to all the interviews. And maybe you want to say a word about it. Yeah, well, um, you know, it's funny. I had started working on a website for him when he was still alive several years prior. And, you know, I got pretty far and then he (laughs) <laughs> he kind of wandered off. He realized, you know, I don't know if I really want people like contacting me and I don't know if I want to have to deal with a bunch of stuff. So it, it died on the vine a little bit at that point. But then, uh, you know, once once he had passed, it, you know, it really felt like it was um, a he was out of my way and B, it was the right time to put something out there to really, you know, <laughs> kind of, you know, celebrate all the work that he had done over, you know, 40 years at the New Yorker and, you know, kind of collect everything into, into one, one spot. Is that the same reason why he never published his autobiography? Because there was a point in which he decided he didn't want everyone to know all his business, but you know, it's funny. I I feel like the, the process of going through writing an autobiography for so many people is just, you know, it's kind of like, a you know, you're kind of taking stock of your entire life. And, you know, maybe when you start the project in the beginning, you think, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to publish this. It's, you know, I'm going to get it out there. And maybe by the time you're done, I don't know if, I mean, you know how it is as writers yourself. Yes, I would would recommend writing a memoir. Then only half of it has to be true. (laughs) Yeah, maybe that. And then you could add the spice and romance memoirs, autobiographies, you know, footnotes. Mm. Well, I mean, I still have, you know, I have the, the actual autobiography here, um, version is, version one and two. <laughs> is it complete? Uh, I don't know if, he, I think he basically thought it was complete. You know, I believe he had maybe sent it to to a publisher at one point. Um, oh, I, I, have a, I have a title I'd like to pitch. Okay. Okay. It's, okay, you have to picture like uh, uh, Citizen Kane, right? Mm-hmm. Um, what was this? What was Citizen Kang's first name? Someone help me. Well, anyway, I don't know. anyway, great Carson elevator Wilson. pitch so far. Thank you. So <laughs> you always want to start with a question. <laughs> yes, and look confused. <laughs> I I've done that. I'm there. Mm-hmm. So it's Frank. Uh, what? 
Three. Oh, God, we're back to this. I'm going to spell it. T-H-P-R-I-N-K-T-H. Yeah. Jessica, before you came on, Michael had an idea that we do like a, a word that you have to guess. And if you get the word correctly, you would win. Oh. You'd win a cartoon. But now you'll understand my idea to try to promote the podcast and do some kind of crazy publicity stunt and to do a, I was going to try to drive a Volkswagen over Michael. That's sort of a stunt. So now you understand Will there the be motivation. any ramp or are you just going to drive it right no, over? just drive. Just, yes. So now you can understand the reasoning. So um, we're fine artists still working out the kinks. Yeah. I, yes. Well, and to explain this, the break the th- is the gag line from my favorite Jack Ziegler cartoon. Oh, okay. Is this helping? A little bit. <laughs> Oh, bit. so it's a, a cartoon of this guy licking an ice cream cone with sprinkles on it. <laughs> oh, and he's, and he's got, saying sprinkles, but it's coming out. And he's sprinkles. got them all over his tongue and yeah. he's saying, think. <laughs> and the woman with him has just a look of glaring disbelief at his, you know, uncouthness. <laughs> and I do remember so that, juvenile. Michael, I do remember that cartoon. Yeah, it, that it does sound familiar. Hey, Jessica, do you have a favorite cartoon of your dad's that kind of sticks in your mind for either like the reason that we all love his cartoons or maybe for a sentimental reason we don't know? Uh, well, there are two that come to mind. Um, one that comes to mind that, you know, is one of my favorites and I know it's the favorite of a lot of other people is where, you know, you have this very dressed up man walking into a room of people who are all sort of, you know, it's obviously a very fancy cocktail party and he's saying, yipes, grownups. You know, just oh, that idea yeah. that you're going <laughs> to you're going to have to have like, you know, proper conversations and it's all going to be very unpleasant. Um, but one of the ones that he did that actually was kind of ripped from the pages of my life was at one point he had done a cartoon where it was a baby book and the baby book is open and there's a little hair taped in there and it says baby's first gray hair. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> because I had come down stairs. I was 19, outraged, absolutely outraged, because I had found my first gray hair. And so I have to assume that's where that cartoon came from. So were you 19 months? No, 19 years, but that's okay, okay. young enough. <laughs> uh, Jessica, you got a great story about your dad with your baby sister. My baby brother, yeah. My oh, it was your baby brother. brother. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So Max was born in August, um, the year that I was about to turn eight, and my younger, the our middle, the middle brother was four. So at that point, um, you couldn't go into the hospital, into the maternity ward, if you were that young. I have no idea what age you had to be. So, so my brother Ben and I are sitting in the car, the big orange VW bus that my dad had at that point, and he had kind of like directed us to which window we should look at because that was going to be, you know, that was the window, the room, my mom's room. It wasn't a very big hospital. This was in Connecticut. And so we're looking at the window, just waiting, waiting. Of course, it takes him forever to get up there. And eventually he comes to the window and he co- he's got, you know, he's got the bundle, he's got the blanket and, you know, oh, of course, you know, we're way too far away. We can't see, but, you know, he's, you know, he's bouncing it and we're like all excited. Oh my God. And so then he keeps bouncing and he bounces and he starts bouncing like really crazy and the blanket goes flying up into the air. And, you know, I'm sitting there absolutely horrified. I don't even know if Ben had any idea what was going on. So, you know, this was just one of, you know, dad's having a fun time fooling around (laughs) with the kids, pretending to throw the, you know, the infant in the air. (laughs) Oh, your dad's got great stories. Uh, Me and Michael have actually enjoyed part of the autobiography because the American bystander, this great humor magazine, published some excerpts. Yeah, yeah. The um, the, uh, Brian McConaughey. Yeah, yep. exactly. Yep. Yeah. And I've always been such a big fan of your dad's. And, and there's always like little connections. I love like he went to Fordham University mm-hmm. and uh, he was at Forest Hills. And I've been at those places so many times and stuff. So I feel like I can get a sense of your dad's footsteps in a way. Yeah. Yeah. And um, one thing I wanted to mention, you and me ran into each other. Um, it was shortly after your dad passed away. Mm-hmm. And I was relaying the story that I told the Pixies the story of hearing the song Monkey Gone to Heaven when you were yeah. going into the restaurant after the memorial. Yeah. Oh uh, my and the God, band was... was very excited to hear that, actually. Oh, that's great. 
that's good. Yeah, that was that was one that he wanted played at his at his memorial. And one of the strangest things we had gone to dinner a, a bunch of us after after the memorial that June, and um, you know that was that was a this was like two thousand what was that two thousand seventeen. So it's yeah. not a song that you would hear on the radio frequently by any stretch. So Kelly and I, my dad's um, <laughs> last wife, um, she and I, you know, we left the party and we were walking out towards the front of the restaurant through the bar of this restaurant, and. I hear it. That song is playing on the ra- you know, on, in the bar of that restaurant. And it was just so strange to have yeah. it. I mean, that, that wasn't us playing it. You know, that was just, it just happened to be playing. It just felt like a sort of my, otherworldly nod. Yeah. My friend, Michael Maslin received a lot of your dad's record collection. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. we were comparing notes and he has the same collection listening to the same like his, in some way, his talent could rub off on me because we listened and liked the same bands. Mm. Love the Kinks and oh, Frank yeah. Black, which is not a very common uh, musician, but I was a huge Frank Black fan who was the lead singer of the Pixies. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I was able to contact them is because I happened to know his wife who was interested in having her children learn cartooning. Oh, wow. So in wow. one, I kind of was talking to her and I said, I just came, I, I just met Jessica Ziegler at the memorial and I related the story. Mm-hmm. That's and that's great. how she, that's how she then shared it with the rest of the band. And they thought the story was amazing. Oh, that's so nice. That's great. I love that. Yeah. He was a huge music fan. I mean, ridiculous. Uh, he, you know, when I was a kid, I remember counting his albums and there was, you know, at that point a thousand, which was a lot, you know, it's a lot of counting for a kid to do. And then he, yeah, had to, yeah. then he decided he needed to put everything on, on tapes, you know, on, you know, the little tapes that you would have in the car. And then that, that had to end and it had to go all to CDs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So Jessica, I had, my first reading of about your dad was in the Lee Lorenz book, the essential mm. Jack Ziegler. Mm-hmm. And I, I created this picture of my mind of him, like a real West coast hipster <laughs> hanging out with like Lawrence Furlan Getty and like, you know, just hitting the road, man and heading East and finding his, uh, you know, f- finding his fortune as a knock around cartoonist. Yeah, well, so, you know, he wasn't a complete in, misconception. I know. Yeah, he was from he was from Queens. He's from Forest Hills. And yeah, he was in California for a while. He went to the Monterey Language Institute there. You know, he went into the army before they could draft him, you know, just to get that. He get was that in military intelligence. Mm, yeah. And true, but a, language a true was oxymoron. His. Yes. <laughs> I know. So yeah, I, I guess reading, he tested into that. So he was able. Yeah, to I was that. reading. I think it was on the website that he had a job researching old movies yeah and found it boring i go that's boring well yeah i don't know i, I don't know how how much research was actually happening in that job i, I got the sense it was more like a you know kind of like managing a bunch of yeah what year what stuff. year would that have been like early 70s it would have been before i was 70s? born so probably the late 60s he so was over the 60s a pain, yeah Ed Sullivan Theater before that. Mm-hmm. Did he ever talk to you about the time he was there the night the Beatles played? Oh, sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. You remember yeah, it was, that? Yeah. Oh, sure. I mean, you know, that was, can you imagine for such a huge music fan to have just been there? He was an usher. So he was, you know, he was on the, he was in the audience basically when that, when that happened. It was, yeah, it was, it must've been amazing. And then he was on Letterman many years later. Mm-hmm. I that, think that must like have been 84. a highlight. Yeah. <laughs> you know what's funny about that? I remember watching it. You know, we stayed up late because it was, you know, I was pretty young at that point. Um, and to me, he, he looked very nervous on, on the show. But, but later, watching it now, it, it doesn't seem that way to me. But it's funny, you know, they actually called and wanted him to come back a second time at some time in the summer and we were just about to leave on some vacation out to long island so he couldn't do it and then that was it they never called again no you, you only tell dave no once that's all you get your memory um your dad being nervous that's funny because i always see him as confident and my memory of your dad is yelling 
and raising his voice at the restaurants during lunch. Anytime we were at lunch together, right, I met him a couple of times and oh, he helped me so much too. We'd talk about cartooning. And when the subject of the magazine would come up, his voice would raise and there would be some arguments and stuff. God, was that after, was that after things got all screwed up with the, <laughs> was it just the magazine or was it, you know, when the, when the cartoon bank was over at the magazine and Ed Claris. It, it was unrelated to that. It was, it was about, you know, your dad was always telling me it's all about the cartoons being funny. He, oh yeah. And he had no patience for cartoons being in the magazine, not based on merit. Hmm. And, uh, He's a great pride in the quality of the collective quality of the magazine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so it wasn't the quality of the pastrami at lunch. No, it had nothing to do with. <laughs> was the he service. was was Jack a picky eater? I I don't remember him being. <sighs> not really, not really. No. So, I what would you was. order for lunch, Bob? You and Jack. This is the kind of detail I need to know. This this would have been where Jessica would have went to. Um, I'm sure at the end, um, pergola. Mm. Yes. It was a French restaurant. Try the Asso Boco. It's delicious. Yeah, this, there was a lunch special for like $84. Yes. Jeez. Even <laughs> I've make, had it. Make sure you eat beforehand. The portions were modest. Uh, and yeah. your dad would give me tips. And he was so giving in regards to that. He, he could see how much, you know, I was just like thirsty for anything he would say about cartooning. Mm. And one thing that stood in my mind is him saying that you don't know anything about your voice yet until you've done like a thousand cartoons. And only then do you really know your work. Mm. I mean, he said that about his own work and in his biography with Leela Renz, he had mentioned that you need to churn out all that work before you realize what's what. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, he went through, you know, I, I have a huge archive of work of his that's unpublished and he would go through you know every so often and just trash old stuff so i mean i think that you know he had, he numbered every cartoon so they went up into the you know the 24 25 thousands but there are a couple that are in like the low hundreds and it's just really interesting to see i mean like the style is so much more um it's more precise it's it's less loose it's less confident you know what i mean it's it's kind of like a little yes. bit more timid a little bit more tight it's a little bulbous and because you've sent me some roughs that have been unpublished that were really early for the mm. collection books that I've done. Mm -hmm. And um, so I had a real lucky opportunity to see some work that hardly anyone else has seen except yeah. for Bob and, and Lee. Right. Right. It's so, yeah. it's so amazing how you do produce all that work and you're doing it for an audience of just like one person really, because there's such a low percentage of sales um, after I was looking back at Jack's work so I could feel like really ready for this, um, going back to my work, I was cleaning up my stuff and I just decided to take like a thousand of my cartoons and burn them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just, I, I, I destroyed them. Yeah. I just, yeah. Well, Bob, thank God you scanned them all first. <laughs> That's true. My dad would trash them well before scanners were. Yeah. Up, scan so. them because what's, so it's interesting that I was reading when uh, Jack sold his first work and, Lee had him brought in and he was wearing his heavy uh, corduroy jacket over a wool knitters, you know, a, a sailor sweater and he was spritzing and dying. And, <laughs> and he sits him down and he goes, could you, could you draw a little more cartoony for us? Oh, could really? You, could you cartoon it up? <laughs> Which is interesting because I guess he drew so he was too realistic for that era. Yeah, sure. And then sure. I'm sure it just didn't fit the, it just didn't fit the jokes, you know? I mean, you need a, they need to kind of work hand in hand. Well, it's interesting because I mean, the car earliest cartoons were very structured and formal. And then there's the crazy Thurber years. And mm -hmm. now uh, it's sort of today when, when I was first starting, they said, Michael, you get, you got to tighten this up. You got to, you, you have to not try to draw funny. Do not mm. draw. And I was, that was my specific direction. Interesting. Yeah. It's, your desk looked like, your furniture looks like it's made out of cheese. <laughs> so do you feel like you've solved that problem? Uh, well, I, I eat a lot of cheese now. But. <laughs> Michael, stand up for your own work. I love the way you draw it. Your work makes me hungry. 
<laughs> yes, exactly. I, I think it's a holy achievement. There you go. <laughs> so anyway, but it's interesting the way the uh, pendulum of uh, what the powers that be are looking for in a cartoon style. Mm. Well, it's interesting, you know, like when, when my dad and Roz and, you know, some of those guys were all coming up. I mean, you know, you look at what was going on on Saturday Night Live at that time. There was this whole kind of like absurdist kind of humor that was just like leaking into everything. And I feel like, you know, a lot of that was apparent in the cartoons. And, you know, now, I don't know. I mean, you know, there's different sensibilities and different uh, hot buttons that need to be hit it seems. Um, I don't know. If it, the, it does seem like the hot buttons now are very tepid. You're hitting the tepid button, <laughs> you know, or the lukewarm button. Yeah. Let's, let's uh, just, let's just barely tap on it. Just tap, tap, tap. Yeah. It's hard. You know, I'm sure it's hard to come up with, you know, evergreen stuff. Um, Speaking of point. evergreens, one of your dad's favorite cartoons of mine was, this was before the cartoon, the, the caption contest. They used to have this thing called, or this might've been a sketchbook, but they had this mm -hmm. thing called the back page. Mm. And it was the day after Christmas mm -hmm. and then, and the Times Square Christmas tree had been shoved into a <laughs> yeah. trash can. The giant tree sticking yeah. out of this tiny little trash can. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, I have um, to chime in and give my favorite cartoon. Mm. My favorite Jack Ziegler cartoon was the answer to a question. I remember on the panel was uh, the question was, what's my favorite cartoon of all time? It happens to be a Jack Ziegler cartoon. Mm. And that is, a metaphor for the tri-state area. That was the banner. Mm -hmm. And then the visual was two guys arguing at the tennis net. They were arguing with tennis rackets. And one said New York and one said New Jersey. Yeah. And isn't there, isn't there like a, a referee? There's a, there's a chair umpire. And <laughs> he's reading the newspaper, totally uninterested. And he's Connecticut. Yeah, uh, that's basically how it felt <laughs> growing up in Connecticut. I didn't realize, you know, when I was a kid that there were other tri-state areas. I thought, you know, we were it. <laughs> that cartoon changed my thinking and cartooning. That mm. was a turning point for me to say cartooning could really have meat on the bone. That mm. You could mm -hmm. really make a point and you could be so creative. And it just like opened the doors of what you could, how you could use the page to say these things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I tell you, really, I mean, one of the things that really helps become a good cartoonist is being really, really smart and knowing a lot of stuff. Because, I mean, he just, you know, he he had a lot of just access to knowledge that he could reference in so many different ways. I mean, he was he was impossible to play Trivial Pursuit with because you could never win unless he was on your team. It was absolutely impossible. Did he influence you and your studies? Did, did it inspire you to be well-read and very cultured? Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I, I went and got a, a BFA in painting and, you know, there was never any time that I felt discouraged from pursuing art in any way. Um, you know, I didn't really do anything with, with cartoons because that was definitely like his, his area, I felt. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, you know, I mean, it was, you know, his office was right in the house. So it was, you know, it was always happening and everything was always right there. Yeah. So when did you realize dad's job was a little different? <laughs> than uh, I, I do remember kids. like, yeah, I remember in like, you know, third or fourth grade, you know, people would say, oh, what does your dad do? And I would, I would tell them he was a cartoonist and they would say, oh, like, you know, like Saturday morning cartoons. No, no. Oh, so like Garfield? Mm, no. And then, you know, you mentioned the New Yorker to like a, a fourth grader and it, it has no weight at all. Just no, no credibility to be gained from that for me. But did he ever go to career day? That was a point Michael made with me. We were wondering if he ever showed up and you were the star of the class. No, I don't. I, you know, I mean, he might have gone to something maybe with one of the boys or when I was really young, I remember there was a career day where the guy who owned the local movie theater came and he brought everybody MTV buttons. And that was, Oh man, you couldn't do any better than that in sixth grade an MTV button. Oh yeah. But Jack told everyone he was an orthodontist. <laughs> did he do that? No. He should have brought I'm sure New he York did. I was there. He should have no. brought New Yorker tote bags. That's, those are hard to get your hands on. I finally just got one and I've been a subscriber for like oh, I, have, years. I have a great hack for that if you need to know. Oh, really? Let's just let it. your subscription lapse and then take the special. Oh. I have 25 in my closet. <laughs> you get a pretty penny for those. 
on eBay. Jessica, that's where we cut like half the show. I will be hurt at all. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's one more question I want to ask about your dad's work. And that is, was there a point in which he said he was only going to work for the New Yorker and not be published in other places? Or did he always feel like it, the work could go anywhere? I think that, you know, I mean, early on, of course, you know, everybody was submitting everywhere. And then, you know, you, you kind of get the whole right of first refusal with the New Yorker. Um, I think they do that with the contract. You know, I don't, th- I don't know if they do contracts anymore, but part of the contract was basically the New Yorker would see everything and get, you know, the right to reject it before you took it somewhere else. So I know that when he was doing stuff for like Playboy, it was stuff that, you know, the New Yorker was never going to publish, but you know, he showed it to them first and then wandered over to Playboy. I don't, you know, I know that once he was on like a real, the real contract, I don't know that he was submitting to a ton of other places. I mean, the places were disappearing. So that was, that was hard, but there were some ad jobs and things like that, that would come in and he, you know, worked on various books and some children's books. So there was always something else going on. Yeah. So there's a book called the joy of stress, which we, have recently ripped off with the, uh, <laughs> well he didn't write it he only illustrated it, elements so of stress it. well we we try to rip off the illustrations too so <laughs> it's too bad we didn't make the to book together the three of us could have worked on the book together it's an homage yeah right right yeah sure it's an homage uh-huh <laughs> <laughs> i mean that that book was published in what like 1980 or something i mean 1984 Okay. And then it was reissued in 2001, I believe. Yeah, or 2000. And it's really surprising how mm. I'd never seen it. I yeah. I don't think a lot of people did though. It was kind no. of because the writer wasn't big. It was all your father's work that was really of interest. Oh, I, I don't know. We have to get it. We're going to do an, I have one here somewhere. I do have a copy here somewhere. Do you have artwork around in your, your oh place? Oh my God. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, like right, right above my desk, which you guys can't see and they definitely can't see on the podcast. I've got two Jacks, a Roz, a Liza, a Tom Toro, two Barsadis, a Mankoff, a Mick Stevens. Mike Lee's so, not, she's not mentioning our names. That's true. I don't know. Well, you know what? Actually, I don't think I saw any of your stuff at my dad's. You know, he had. Yeah, I don't, I don't give my stuff place. away anyway. Yeah. So these were all trades right. that he yeah. had done. You know. Jessica, check the bathroom. And check the shower <laughs> curtain. I have a shower curtain out. Uh, <laughs> I saw that. It looks Bob, great. you should send Jessica a shower curtain. <laughs> well, I could send a cartoon, but it's really, really presumptuous to send a. Uh, <laughs> Be Jessica presumptuous. Or a cartoon. <laughs> oh, my God. I would love to have a cartoon. Yes, well, Jessica never. Okay, how many cartoons do you look at in a day? Um, well, it depends on the day. It depends on what I'm doing. You know, I put, uh, I do the the emails that go out on Thursdays are called the latest. And so they usually have between five and eight cartoons. And so I'm usually trying to work with some sort of a theme or hit, you know, certain topics. So, right. you know, I, I definitely have to go through a lot of cartoons. I also do the social media posting. So um, every two weeks, I, you know, gather a bunch of cartoons and populate all of that stuff and let that run for for two weeks. So, yeah, it depends on the day. I mean, it can be it can be a lot. It can be a lot, you know. So when I had this, this is an interesting question, at least to me. Uh, So when you have a client who has no idea what they want, how is Mm -hmm. there a way to lead them into the cartoon forest so it won't be completely lost well yeah usually you know if somebody has something you know basically ultimately it's a problem they're trying to solve right they're trying to communicate something with with a cartoon or you know make reference to something so i mean if you can talk to them a little bit and get a sense of what it is that they're trying to accomplish then you know knowing knowing the archive as well as as any of us at cartoon stock do we you know it's pretty it's not that hard for us to, to try to find something and you know if if it truly doesn't exist you know there's always the opportunity to to find an artist to commission something and jessica with so much work that you see mm-hmm. and given where you your background is you are a cartoon expert and this podcast <laughs> is for cartoonists can you think of any advice you could give cartoonists i mean i really think that you could be sort of a life coach for cartoonists at this point. <laughs> Do you see a blatant like 
a mistake that that other people make in their work or, or something. I don't know what, but I feel like you have insight that you're not sharing. Come on, I need <laughs> well, I help. Mean, you know, you want you want the you want the the drawing to look good. You know, I mean, that doesn't mean that you have to be this amazing Oops. amazing draftsman. Bob, we're in trouble. Well, <laughs> well Mike, not necessarily you because. Meeting? You know, yes. I mean, there there are plenty of you know. If you you could talk about Roz not necessarily being the the most amazing, you know, she's not going to draw, you know, a a perfectly buff figure. No, no, she draws a, a Roz but, you know, figure exactly, and that's you know, I mean, her sure. personality is so incredibly baked into the work she does, and I would say that probably the same. I could say the same probably of you two. Like you know, if I see one of your cartoons, Michael, or one of yours, Bob's, I'll, I'll know it's yours. Just like if you see a Mankoff, you're going to know it's his. Yes. But that's um, all the dots. It's so, hard to miss. But you, like what I guess my dad had said about doing a thousand cartoons to kind of get at what you're trying to get at. Cause you know, he would always say, you know, I'm trying to, I'm trying to do what's funny to me because trying to anticipate what somebody else is going to find funny is, is something you're, it's almost, impossible like how are you going to do that people's senses of humor are too too different so you know if you can kind of you know i mean a anybody who tries to be a cartoonist has to be smart in some way so just you know what's funny to you you must already have a good sense of humor to, to be even trying to do this well i gotta ask then what what makes you laugh you no, have a favorite laugh. you, you've met a lot of like big names through your dad person mm -hmm. is there somebody who you no, that's like your personal favorite. Um, in terms of their cartoons or in terms of their actual real life personality? <laughs> so that is the dinner <laughs> companion. I meant the cartoon. <laughs> um, well, you know, I mean, even when I was a kid, Roz was always one of my favorites. Um, you know, I, it's it's been interesting working with at the, you know, at cartoon stock, because I've had to do a much deeper dive into so many of the cartoonists that, you know, I always loved Bruce Eric Kaplan. Oh, um, yeah. yeah, you know, he's got great stuff. I mean, Frank Cotham is one who I, you know, I, I don't think I had really seen his work cohesively in the way that I do now. Um, so I feel like, it, to my mind, he was underrepresented in my my list, my hierarchy of of cartoonists that I really that I really like. That's interesting because the Cotham aesthetic to me is like a couple somewhere in the either in in the outback or in the Russian steppes or in the forest. <laughs> and it like, can be. Yeah, it and they're like be. sitting on a porch or a bench. But, but, but you there's know a something? darkness. There's a darkness. Yeah, and there, work, there is. It's you know? it's almost like a Russian Gothic kind of. Something's yeah, going but on let me, there. But let me share. I know Frank, and he okay. shared batches with me before. Mm -hmm. And those are the cartoons they want from him. And they kind of keep to his type. Oh, interesting. It's, the cartoons that he gets rejected are way more cheerful and airy. Huh. And it just happens to be that kind of like making it sure that it's in Frank's world in the same way that yes. Ross has a certain world. Everyone has a certain world. And so I think probably is a side of Frank that wants to break away from that darkness and, and that mm. sort of, uh, yeah, repetitiveness. Sure. And some of the, some of the younger ones that I really like, you know, I love Tom Toro's stuff. He's, he's, you know, he's got a really beautiful style. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, are you, really... uh, are you acquiring a taste for the British cartoonists since cartoon stock was originally, <laughs> Oh, wait, 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 Jessica, let me explain that. Um, uh, uh, the co-host thinks he's British now. He's oh, yeah. in <laughs> went fact, my, and got uh, citizenship. He's like, he's switching teams and everything. Whoop. Now it all comes back every podcast to something to do with the Brits. So if you just want to play along, but hello. Yeah. Here <laughs> we go. <Jessica. laughs> when we started working with the cartoon stock guys, cause they're all over in England and poor Joel. I mean, I just love the accent so much and I couldn't help myself. I was constantly trying to do it and it was so <laughs> bad. It was so bad. He just cringed every single time. I seem to have grown out of it. It took me about two and a half years. I but find I seem people to have affect a British accent to be very tiring. <laughs> yeah, I'm not even going to try to do it. What's I'm not going to embarrass myself. <laughs> do you deal I have no trouble accent? embarrassing myself. Do you deal with a lot of British cartoons or are you just dealing with the American side? I mostly deal with the American side. Joel still basically kind of, you know, um, mostly deals with with all of the all the British guys who've been around uh, for a long time. You know, he was their main point of contact for twenty years. So I think. What's interesting, your 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 payment still comes in 
either in pounds or in euros or in or in drachmas. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because because we bought cartoon stock and cartoon stock was, you know, a British company trying to trying to figure out the banking is, you know, it's just a it's a really I go, oh, process. I've gotten 125,000 euros. Drachmas. Mm-hmm. Wait a minute. In PayPal. But isn't it, comes it out nice? 12... Because you see your pounds, but then, you know, you convert it to dollars and it's a higher number. Oh, so that's always whoops. fun. That's not working for me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, uh, Jessica, Michael's been a real royal pain in the ass about this whole British thing. And I, uh, I just hope he can make it over there. We're all rooting for him. I, I have a lot of British cartoonists I like. There are personal favorites that you've been featuring. Mm. Just give a little love out to a couple of them now. They can find Jeremy Banks. Mm-hmm. And uh, another cartoonist who's really wonderful, people should go check out at the cartoonstock.com is Steve Way. Mm, he had yeah. one cartoon only in the New Yorker. Mm-hmm. And that cartoon was God resting. And he's saying, I did the work in seven days and I billed them for eight. <laughs> really nice so now, cartoon. is that a God cartoon or is that a lawyer cartoon? Like, how do we categorize? It's that? everything. It works. No, in Bob, situation. Bob, that should be billed them for seven and did it in six. No. No? <laughs> no, not really. Bob. There aren't eight days in a week, except in a Beatles song. Yeah. And Jack was there when they sang it. Hey, now, call now back. Pl- please go to that cartoon. And you'll see that God, I swear to God, looks like Ringo. Oh, he really? Drew <laughs> God like Ringo. <laughs> uh, just like, a little fun fact. Uh, Eric Cap. <laughs> um, Jessica, what announcements do you want to make first as a, as a cartoon pad exclusive? Oh, Jesus. I didn't realize I had to come with exclusive oh, we just exclusive make it up so you can just oh. it's on it's on the flyer yeah, right? make something up no one will yeah you can <sighs> use the volkswagen idea which i'm really high on right now or uh <laughs> i think you're just really high i think that that should be you know that should be the first podcast that you guys actually do on video everybody wants to see it when you uh when you run yes with, and we can do an over. ad campaign instead of think small we could do think squish yeah and you could be shouting out britishisms the entire yes. time <laughs> But Jessica, what about if Bob sits in MoMA in a chair for three months straight? Okay. We'll Can you him, imagine we'll how give, creaky that would be to try to get up again? We'll give him some bathroom breaks and uh, once in a while come by with a snicker bar. But I'm he would you, never be able to sit still that long. There's not a chance. You can't get him to sit still for 30 minutes. Well, Jessica, longer. I tragically have a BFA in painting also. So oh, do you? Yes. And I said, the one thing I learned from my BFA in painting is I couldn't paint. Oh, no, so, but <laughs> I, uh, I did figure out I could draw stuff. So mm. there you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It got me it did, here. It did feel like, I mean, did you ever think about, I mean, the idea of majoring in drawing always seemed kind of like, I don't know why I thought painting made any more sense. Like somehow that would be more legitimate. I well, it's funny. I was the first generation in my, my family to go to college. And I told my parents, Mom, Dad, I'm off to be a, a neo abstract expressionist in St. Louis. Thanks. <laughs> and my dad said, "Okay, just make sure you take math." Wow. So there you go. <laughs> so yeah. as a painter, I made a fairly good waiter. So Jessica, <laughs> right. as we finish up this interview, uh, we should end on your work. What was yes. your yeah? What was your style of painting when you when you took studies in school? Um, it was it was bold you know it was just really like aggressive and um you know i did i wasn't particularly abstract you know it was more you know either figurative or you know something something that i could actually you know see something that you could you could discern what it was but you know pretty colorful pretty pretty brash um but you know you get out of school and you got to figure out how to how to make a living so computers called you know figured well, out you, how to do you all think the you'll return stuff. to painting though you could go I back know. i know i know i actually just recently bought a bunch of paint and stuff because i really, everything that i had was all you know was like 20 years old and completely dried out and everything yeah i don't know it's hard to well, say that's exciting though that's great that you bought, <laughs> you bought the supplies you got that's right use that's them. step one right step yeah. one is throwing some money at the problem <laughs> No, I mean, that, that'd be great to go back to it and you need it because you're in a stressful, stressful profession. 
You're working with cartoonists. <laughs> Dealing with people <laughs> like us. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And it's going to get worse before it gets better with that contest. I said with everyone holding the car. Mm. That's your idea to you. You run with that. Okay. Because after like day six or seven, people get cranky. I bet they do. Well, this is going to have to happen in Bob's driveway. So, yeah. I mean, I'll I'll stay in Colorado. I'm not going to come after that. (laughs) We'll do it virtually. (laughs) Yeah. And just just hold on to, just hold the screen. Jessica, you have to do play by play. Oh, God. Well, we'll do it through like a nest, one of those ring light cameras that, you know, on his front door. Well, just, you have I'll online fans now. You got to be on because you have all the online fans from people who have been following on your Facebook. You could explain that Bob does the Friday every biweekly a, a, a Facebook event. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna do the next one on the fourth, June fourth, with Roz. Roz is gonna we're gonna have a little conversation with with Roz and Bob, so that'll be fun. We're doing it. We we did them two weeks back to back in the beginning, and now we're thinking more like monthly is probably more realistic. Um, just so people don't get sick and tired of us. <laughs> well, we're not getting sick of you, but I am going to let you go so you can get back to wherever you. I'm a little tired of Bob, though. I know. <laughs> I well, he's been that. around a lot longer. And I he's mean, trying to kill you know. me now. <laughs> I'm doing it with love. I'm doing it for your own good. I'm trying to make you famous. <laughs> oh, my God. Try to do a guy a favor. Uh, okay. I'll, I'll hold still. You go get the Volkswagen. No, but Jessica, this has been really delightful to hear all your stories and stuff and to see you. And and I want to thank you for the work you're doing there because you are helping us and you are doing the Lord's work. We're trying, man. We're trying. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Well, thanks for having me. It was great to to, to come on and be able to talk to you guys. Thanks. Thanks It's nice meeting you again, Jessica. (laughs) Once again. Once again. again. (laughs) Trolla. All right. Bye-bye. All right. Uh, Michael, how was that? Isn't she a delight? Jessica is a delight. I mean, even better than Jessica Rabbit. And that's going some. I'm going to go back and enjoy her dad's work again, because it's just on my mind. And it really is inspirational. Her dad, we were not exaggerating. Her dad really was a, this godfather of, of gag cartooning in a golden age. And he really ushered in a lot of a lot of that great style that we all like now. Yes, I actually surprised when I went back and saw how much I had been influenced by him without really realizing it until you pointed out, Bob. Well, thank you. Yes. Look at that. Yes. I was helpful. Um, well, Very I thank- helpful. <laughs> okay, let's talk. That was a little bit helpful. Um, kind of helpful. Kind of help. Uh, Marty? You were very helpful. Thank you for uh, another show. I try. I do what I can. Thank you. And Marty, I want to thank. Yeah, you produced. And uh, you produced. Michael, let me go get the Volkswagen gassed up. Okay. <sighs> take one for the team. Don't be such a baby. Um, I want to thank you get everyone. the mini. I know if you have ran on me with your mini, it would fall apart. <laughs> if you if you if you ran if you if you got the menu to do anything yeah uh bob's mechanic would be over the moon because yes. that car that car would end up back in the shop where it spends 90 percent of its time yes here's a recreation of bob running over me in the mini oh, <laughs> the only thing mini about that car is what it turns into your bank account Nah. How dare you, Judas? No, really. No, let me just say this. First of all, you drive a Fiat. Yes. But someone who drives a Fiat, you have some hell of a nerve making fun of my mini. And you drive, really a, ups- you drive a Fiat in Minnesota? I, uh, it's Wisconsin, <laughs> sir. Oh, I'm sorry, Wisconsin. <laughs> it's a Fiat 500X. I'm really upset. You know, uh, somebody said that our show reminded them of car talk, but without the humor. <laughs> but at least now we have the cars. We have the cars. I actually oh, went the on, um, we are the We are the new Malyatsi brothers of cartooning. We're the old ones. All right. That's enough for everyone. I'm not going to put anyone through anymore. Thank you, listeners. Thank you, cartoonists, cartoon lovers. That's another episode of the Cartoon Pad. Where should we look for the Cartoon Pad? Very good point, finally. Um, we're on Spotify. We're on iTunes. 
You can go actually to uh, Marty, our producer. Can you go to the Weekly Humorous and find the cartoon pad link there? You can. You can, you can do that. And you can um, you can go to the cartoonpad.com on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and you can find it all there too. Yeah, definitely follow us, and then we'll have some kind of rapport. Right now, we have to connect more. More of a rapport with our the letters that we're getting. We want to see some <laughs> letters that are not so painful. Um, so <laughs> let's all stay well, stay funny, stay six feet back. Thank you.